service or military service. So either he was too old or he was just strictly black. Um, Mr. DeWitt had records of military service. Uh, the other folks didn't. So there was no record that they were doing military service. Well, just a comment. Charleston had the largest Jewish congregation in the colony. Yeah. So it's not unlikely that we would have had Jews. I know we have these Georgetown. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's very possible. And the other thing is that these blacksmiths could not have made the swords by themselves. It probably they required three or four people. Because at some point in the life of that sword, it had to go into a forge that was long enough to take the entire length of the sword. No, no, I don't want that. <laughs> wow. This is a sword that, that was owned by the it's a potter sword, owned by the uh, St. John de Brunswick Museum. And it's a relic, it's all been brought away. But the interesting thing is you can see the way it was built. The, the tang carries to the handle right up to the big thing. It's all one piece. Right. So it would run through here. So the, the length that the blacksmith had to have in his forge is at least that long. And that's bigger than an average forge. So he had to have a forge that was long enough to take that blade. He also had to have the ability to take three pieces of metal, get them to the right heat, two pieces arriving at that temperature at a different temperature than the third piece, all out of the fire at the same time, and then he had to hammer them all together before they start to cool off. And you don't have three hands, which means you had to have a helper. So the um, the tradition is that three or four blacksmiths, or a blacksmith and a couple of helpers, had to work to make a sword because of the length of the blade. So this was not a one-man operation in any of these cases. So there were probably other people uh, working either as apprentices or smiths in these, these um, workshops where they're making the swords. And then they would have to have somebody separate make the, 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 the wooden handle and somebody separate make the scabbards out of leather. You know, leather, not metal, but they could rust. Leather scabbards. Um, other questions? Yes. Um, did, if you, what was the length of the sword? The length of the sword was roughly 38 inches. This is approximately right. 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 And it had that curved blade. Was that the standard cavalry sword? Pretty much. The British, some of them had a, a straight blade. Uh, when you, a blacksmith would say, draw out when you thin out a piece of metal, it naturally tends to curve. But the thought is it would cut better if it had a slight curve. Right. Yeah, that was the difference. The cavalry sword was for slashing rather than... It would do both. I mean, it would do both. Do right. both. The other thing is a lot of people, if you notice, um, this is a close-up of the blade. Um, the under the, the lighting is not too good, but you can see the difference in the material. This is the iron, that's the steel, it's rusted a little bit more. Um, you notice there's no fuller. The fuller is just a groove in the sword blade, and a lot of people call them blood letters. That's not what they were for. Uh, the blade had to be stiff enough so if you tried to drive it through something, it wouldn't bend. All right. And the way they did that is, you know, an arch stronger than a, a, a straight, a straight piece of anything. Uh, for example, can you make this piece of paper just stand up straight. You can get the idea. By folding it, you create a whole lot of little arches, and all of a sudden it's stiffer, and it stands up straight. So they would put that little hollow this in the sword blade, because they could lighten the blade that way, still have it be stiff enough to work. Other questions? This is, by the way, a great parlor trip. <laughs> uh, okay. well, I think it's pretty well established it will work in metal and snow out where his parents camp was, but do you think they were actually lighting swords there? I don't know. Uh, I think they probably were showing horses there. I'm not sure, I don't know if they'd made swords there or they would have kind of hid them away in different corners so they'd be less, less conspicuous. Yeah. Um, 
it's probably they probably made all the swords he needed in a couple of weeks, month, month and a half. There's a question over here. Back. Did you see any, any other orders for hatchets or cow troughs or anything like that? No, hatchet actually. Um, they wouldn't use that in the manufacture of a sword because only the very thin part of the blade was actually steel. The rest of it was, was, was wrought iron. And that was true with size and a lot of other agricultural instruments. They just had a very thin strip of, of steel along the edge. The saw on the end was all, all steel. And it was generally that, that better sheer steel because of the nature of what the saw does. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. Charles. Karen, how many man hours to make a sword? I think it kind of depended upon the materials you started with, um, how, how talented you were. Uh, all I can say is that um, in the equipment you had, the forged and fire people are given a week to come up with a sword. Um, the uh, potter said with five five workmen he could make 25 swords in a week, and that that would be assembly line. So somewhere in between there. Uh, and again, it depends on how many workmen you had, the quality of the workmen, the quality of your tools. If you have a an anvil and a hammer, and you're a village blacksmith, it's going to take you a lot longer than if you have a setup with a with a power water wheel that's working the bellows and, and working a trip hammer for you. You mentioned you found some information from the index. Yeah. I've been into the index for, I think it was about a day. I read every single blankety blank book, <laughs> cover to cover. Okay, you read the books, you're not going into the max No, no, that, that, I would still be doing that. Yeah. Um, okay, you know, so and so, two cows, so and so. 14 days in the militia, so-and-so, a pig, you know, and on and on and on. Everybody, I don't say everybody, but it, it's interesting the things that people put in. Two people put in for payment as a spy, which I thought was kind of strange. Um, but uh, they put in for uh, boat lost, for ferry services. Uh, they took your horse, they took your saddle, they took your pistols, they took your musket, whatever. People would put in for that. Marion uh, later, uh, uh, Peter already kept the journal. Unfortunately, the best part of the journal he gave to Weems and, and it lost, but parts of his journal still exist. And then he mentioned that Marion had commented to him that uh, all he, Marion, had to give out was IOUs, basically. Had the British simply paid people in gold, we never could have won the revolution. But uh, all he had was IOUs to give. And at the end of the war, the state paid them off. Uh, it took them a while, but they did pay them off. And that, that's interesting. And going back to Alexander Hamilton, you know, one of the reasons he's on our $5 bill, and one of the reasons the United States credit is as good as it is, is Hamilton, against all uh, advice to the contrary, insisted upon paying off the entire debt of the United States for the American Revolution. And we've always paid our debts, and that's, that's a good thing. 